Okay. Okay. Time to go. Yeah. Okay. Oh my God. My slice was blocked here. Okay. Yeah. Just hold on one second. Uh, okay, there comes. Okay. Ah, nice. Ah. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, so glad to meet you here on the Friday's talk. This is Alice Stang from Peking University. And uh, I'm uh, so happy to meet everyone every Friday. So uh, it's already be, uh, I can ask talks, not only talks, of course, right? For everyone in the, uh, in the university, they uh, stay here uh, waiting for the wonderful talks. So uh, we're proud of that. Uh, actually this month, uh, we have the, uh, you know, uh, big, you know, July, because in July we have uh, six speakers. Uh, this was the first week we have Professor Patrick from uh, Paris. And uh, next week we're going to have uh, two young scientists, as all I can ask the young scientists are world is, uh, Hai Ding Shen and Deep. Uh, both of them win the award last year. So, uh, and after that, uh, we will have a Chiu Min from Westlake University. And uh, then we will have a, a scientist who was from, uh, from a far place, is from Argentina. So yeah, he's a uh, mathematics. Yeah, so Eva did a great job, you know, uh, to introduce this. And uh, afterwards, uh, after that, we will have a uh, Taki Lee was from Seoul National University going to talk more about the flexible electronics. So uh, this month will be very, uh, you know, crowded and busy. So because of all these wonderful speakers and all these wonderful talks. So I hope all of you, you know, keep on going to see us on the Friday. This talk. So uh, this first talk and this big month for sure is a big name. And then we have a big panel. So uh, today we have, you know, Professor Nicholas here. And we have uh, Gu Zhen, we have uh, Yi Kun Li, we have Tian Yuan uh, so, well, as our panelist. And uh, our speaker is Professor Patrick. Uh, he's very famous. But today, not me going to introduce Professor Patrick. I'm going to ask uh, Professor Nicholas Peppers to introduce uh, uh, Professor Patrick. Uh, Professor Nicholas, are you ready? I am ready, yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Alice. A good evening to everybody. Good afternoon in Europe. Good morning in the United States. I am delighted to introduce Professor Patrick Couvreur. I looked at the schedule of the, uh, the last uh, two years, and I think it's only the second time that we have a member of the Academy, the first one from France. The first one was Professor Jean-Marie Le Pen, so, uh, Jean Marie Len, and so, sorry. And uh, so, we have really a great pleasure to have Patrick, whom I have known for more than 40 years. Uh, Patrick, uh, <laughs> you know, <noticed> the picture <laughs> appearing from about 40 years ago at the University of Paris. Patrick was a native of, of, uh, of Belgium. And he started, he did his PhD in Belgium and he started his studies and he was an independent chef de recherche, as we say, in Brussels, where he did his first few students. And then he was invited at the University of Paris, what we used to call at that time, University Paris Sud, that means South Paris. It's in a suburb of Paris, or it was in a suburb of Paris, until, as I understand now, in a place called Chateau Malabry, where he, with other people, was able to develop probably the most famous school of pharmacy in uh, Europe. And of course, pharmacy worldwide known. 
He was director, many, many students that came out of his laboratories, many names that many of you know passed through his laboratory. Uh, Marie Jose Alonso, we knew her as Marie, Marie Jose Alonso, Elias Fatal. Uh, I mean, it's impossible for me. And tremendous interactions with the United States, with Professor Langer's laboratory and mine. Already in the 1980s, he had started working on micro and nanoparticles. He was always very interested in treatment of diseases. There was a very strong period where he started working with cancer treatment. But at the same time, he was interested. I remember in 1988, we published a small paper on oral delivery of insulin. We were trying to do really a variety of things. Since then, of course, very independent and so on. I'm proud to tell you that Patrick is recognized by some of the most important awards in the world. He's a member of the French Academy, and that is really a significant, significant recognition. He is a member at the same time of the French Academy of Medicine and Phar Pharmacy, the Spanish Academy. In the United States, he has been elected both to the National Academy of Engineering and to the National Academy of Medicine. He has received some truly major awards, especially the Madsen Medal that came from uh, as a European pharmaceutical scientist. And uh, he has honorary degrees from the University of Ghent in his fatherland in Belgium and from the University of Montreal in Canada. Uh, his work, I will let him talk a little more about it, but he was really the pioneer who took nanoparticles and tried to see how he could develop them for a treatment of a very large number of diseases with a huge laboratory. And this came because as a young man, he spent some time at the ETH group in Zurich with a famous and of course departed professor Peter, Peter Speiser. And there was a community of scientists that came out of that group. And these scientists now are leading the field with the ideas. So when you hear the word nanoparticles, you really have to understand that the area of nanotechnology in the pharmaceutical field had been proposed by Peter Speiser as early as 1960 or 65. I remember a, an article in the very obscure journal Die Pharmazie in which uh, Speiser was talking about some of his work at that time. So hopefully Patrick, if he has time, he will tell us a little bit about it. But he is present uh, officially Professor Emeritus, but he's still very active at the Université Paris-Saclay, which for those of you who know the classification, it's one of the most famous uh, university groups in, in, in France. And uh, at the same time, I want to say one last thing, which is very dear to my heart, the president of the French Republic in December 2017 uh, honored him with the, with the title of Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur. If you, yes, you don't realize it, that means Knight of the Legion of Honor, which is one of the highest recognitions you can give in France. And of course, he has been professor at Collège de France, where De Gênes and many others were professors. Patrick, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you. I want to welcome also the panelists and the students who will ask the hard questions after your talk. And I am delighted you have agreed to talk to us today. Thank you, Patrick. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nick, for this uh, so kind uh, and friendship uh, introduction, uh, which touched me uh, a lot. Thank you also to you and to Alice for the uh, invitation uh, to speak today about uh, nanomedicine for the treatment of uh, severe uh, disease. So I will share my screen. Do you see my screen correctly? Yes. Thank you. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to, to, to share with you uh, some uh, research we have done with advanced nanomedicine for the treatment of uh, 
uh, severe disease. As you know, when you are administering a drug as a conventional chemotherapy, the drug is sometimes uh, limited in terms of pharmacological activity because of a poor diffusion through biological barriers. This means that uh, the drug will have a low, not all of course, but some drugs will have a low bioavailability. Some drugs uh, which are arising from the nanotechnologies, especially the peptides, the proteins, the nucleic acids, are subject to a fast metabolization and to rapid degradation. Also, not all, but some of them, especially in the field of the cancer, are characterized by an unspecific tissue and cell biodistribution, which result, of course, in a low pharmacological activity with a lot of side effects and eventually toxicity. Also, some drugs are very efficient, but they are characterized by a low intracellular capture. And if the biological target is located intracellularly, then you can imagine that uh, once again, it is a limitation for the pharmacological activity. And finally, a lot of, uh, of uh, drugs in the field of the cancer, in the field of the uh, uh, infectious disease uh, will induce uh, resistance. And of course, now it is possible to encapsulate those drugs into nanotechnologies, into nanocarriers, with a size in between a few tens and a few hundreds of nanometers. And if the encapsulation here is well done, then you will be able to protect the drug from the metabolization, from the degradation. Also, as I will show you, it is possible to decorate those nanoparticles with some ligands. You can pegylate those nanoparticles to have a better cell and tissue targeting and therefore a better therapeutic index. Also, you can use some specific ligands allowing to increase the intracellular penetration of those compounds, generally through an endocytotic process. Also, because the drug will be delivered by the nanotechnology in a different way uh, into the cells, you will be able, in some cases, to overcome some mechanism of resistance. And finally, you can combine in the same nanotechnology uh, different functionalities, a therapeutic functionality because you are encapsulating uh, uh, drugs, but also an imaging functionality, and this is a so-called nanotheranostic approach. Well, during this presentation, I will try to share with you uh, with some example of advanced technologies that we have used in our lab, allowing to overcome not all, but some of those different limitations. I will start first with the application in cancer therapy, showing you that the encapsulation of anti-cancer drugs into nanocarriers will increase the anti-cancer efficacy and also, very importantly, reduce the uh, toxicity. The first example is already uh, old, and it is the discovery of the first biodegradable and injectable nanoparticles based on a biodegradable polymer, which is the polyalkyl cyanoacrylate. You know that the monomer, the cyanoacrylate monomer, is a surgical glue. And in fact, from a toxicological point of view, uh, it represented a favorable a priori. And from a chemical point of view, this monomer is very amazing because, contrary to the other uh, acrylic uh, uh, monomers, the cyanoacrylic monomers are able to polymerize by an anionic polymerization process in a water medium, as you can see here, leading to the formation of the biodegradable polyalkyl cyanoacrylate polymer. And now, depending on the uh, preparation process of the nanoparticles, you can design either nanospheres, which are, as you can see here, a sort of matricial polymeric 
uh, a system, or if you are inducing the anionic polymerization process at the interface of a water phase or of an oily phase, depending on the solubility of the encapsulated drug, you can design also nanocapsules, which are rather a reservoir system. But what is common to all those nanoparticles is that after intravenous administration, they will be opsonized. This means that opsonins, like fibronectin, like the FC uh, fragment of the immunoglobulin, like the complements which will be activated at the surface of those nanoparticles, well, all those opsonins will induce after intravenous administration, you know, the concentration of the uh, nanoparticles at the level of the macrophages of the uh, reticular endothelial system, as you can see here in these autoradiographic pictures, where the nanoparticles concentrated into the liver, the spleen, and to a lower extent into the uh, bone marrow. Now, the idea, of course, was to uh, treat uh, uh, some severe hepatic disease using those uh, uh, nanoparticles loaded with an anti-cancer compound, doxorubicin, for the treatment of liver metastasis. And you can see here what was done in 1997, published in British Journal of Cancer. If you are injecting doxorubicin as a free drug in green, you can see that at a dose of 2.5 milligram per kilo body weight, there is no inhibition of the number of uh, metastases. At 5 milligram per kilo body weight of free doxorubicin, you have still 40% uh, percent uh, liver metastasis, and even also at 7.5 milligram per kilo body weight. And the problem is that the toxicity is arising in between 5 and 7.5 milligram per kilo body weight. So you can see that there is a very narrow uh, window, dose window, uh, to treat uh, this type of experimental tumor. And you can see that in red, after administration, of those biodegradable nanoparticles loaded with doxorubicin, you already reduce dramatically the number of metastases at a dose of 2.5 milligram per kilo body weight, and the uh, metastases have practically disappeared at 5 milligram per kilo body weight. And also, we discovered that the cardiac toxicity, which is the limiting toxicity of doxorubicin, had completely disappeared uh, by using. Uh, those nanoparticulate formulation of doxorubicin. And you have just one example showing uh, you here the extended metastasis obtained with the uh, treatment with uh, doxorubicin as a free drug. And you can see here only the small uh, uh, and uh, low number of metastases after the treatment with the uh, nanoparticle. Now, what is very interesting is that you can apply also this technology for the treatment of the multidrug resistant hepatocellular carcinoma. As you know, probably the hepatocellular carcinoma is characterized by uh, the presence of efflux proteins at the level of the membrane of those uh, uh, cancer cells. This means the P-glycoprotein, the MLP, there are other uh, uh, families of uh, efflux proteins. And those proteins, as you can see here, are effluxing the drug from inside of the cell, the toxorubicin from inside of the cell to outside of the cell. In other words, you know, it is a way the cancer cell are using to fight against the chemotherapy. And you have on the right side of the cartoon here a typical example an ex with an experiment that we did. By using a human hepatocellular carcinoma, you can see that after increasing uh, the concentration of doxorubicin as a free drug with the uh, HUH7 uh, hepatocarcinoma cells, you can see that there was 100% of cell viability because of this multidrug resistant phenotype. And the idea we had was 
to encapsulate DOCS3BC into those biodegradable polyalkyl cyanide nanoparticles to mask the DOCS3BC from the recognition by the P-glycoprotein and to avoid this efflux process. And it was working well because you can see now that after incubating the uh, nanoparticles loaded with DOCS3BC with the human hepatocellular carcinoma, we restored the sensitivity of the cancer cells towards the chemotherapy. And this was confirmed in preclinical in vivo assays, including uh, hepatocarcinoma intragenic mice. And if you are looking to the apoptosis through tunnel analysis or histological counting, you can see that there was a significant apoptosis of the cancer cells treated with the DOCS3BC nanoparticles, whereas it was not the case after the treatment with DOCS3BC as a free drug, which was at the same level of apoptosis than the single solution of glucose 5%. And this allowed us to create a startup company, which is called BioAlliance. Now the name of the company is uh, Oxeo. And we started first with a, a phase one clinical trials, uh, which, uh, which was a trial to look about the tolerance of the drug and we observed that the uh, doxorubicin loaded nanoparticles were uh, much less toxic uh, from the point of view of the cardiac toxicity and digestive toxicity uh, in phase one comparatively to doxorubicin as a free drug. So we started with a phase two. And as you can see here, the survival rate 18 months after the treatment with doxorubicin loaded with the polyalkyl cyanoacrylate nanoparticles, the name of the specialty is Livatac, was around 90%. And there was only 54% in patients uh, treated with the standard treatment, which at that time was the chemoembolization. This allowed us to start with a phase three uh, clinical trial. It was a multicentric clinical assay in around 40 hospitals worldwide, and very, very rapidly, the liver attack obtained the so-called fast track status from the FDA because the overall safety and tolerability uh, uh, was excellent for those nanoparticles, including in those patients who received the longest treatment uh, in periods over than uh, one year. Unfortunately, at the end of the phase three, when we look to the survival curve, uh, we observed that the leave attack had exactly the same survival curve than the control arm. But in the meantime, because the first phase uh, uh, was uh, long lasting during five years, uh, the uh, control arm was the multi-therapy, including the use of oxaliplatin gemcitabine and the inhibitors of tyrosine kinase, and we were not the best in the class, but equal in the class, even if it was clear that the tolerability was better. But if you will, we can discuss that uh, later on. But uh, from an academic point of view, to still improve the uh, uh, targetability of those nanoparticles, we decorated those nanoparticles with polyethylene glycol to avoid the opsonization process, and by click chemistry, as you can see here, we decorate those nanoparticles with biotin. Why biotin? Because a lot of uh, cancer cells, as you can see here, are characterized by a hyperexpression of the biotin receptor. And in fact, we label those nanoparticles with rhodamine, which is a red. And as you can see here, we labeled the cancer cells, which were the MCF7 breast cancer in green. So the untreated cells were green. When treated, as you can see here on this slide, with the biotin decorated polyalkyl cyanoacrylate nanoparticles, the cancer cells were becoming red because those nanoparticles were indeed able to recognize in a highly specific manner the cancer cells. 
Now, as controls, we use just regulated nanoparticles, but without the biotin. And you can see that in that case, the nanoparticles were unable to enter into the cancer cells, which remained green. And what we did was also a co-culture of healthy cells, which were UVEC, uh, which were labeled, as you can see here, in green, and MCF7 breast cancer cells. It was a co-culture. We incubated this co-culture with the red fluorescent nanoparticles. And you can see that only the cancer cells were becoming uh, red, showing you, uh, at least in vitro, the excellent targetability of those nanoparticles. Now, it is important to remember that the encapsulation in the current uh, uh, nanocarriers, including those polyalkyl cyanoacrylate nanoparticles, other polymeric nanoparticles, polymer micelles, liposomes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, results from physical encapsulation uh, uh, processes. And this results in very poor drug loading, only a few percent. Just to give you one example, with the polyalkyl cyanoacrylate nanoparticles loaded with doxorubicin, the drug loading is only 5%, which is not bad, but if you are comparing uh, with the literature. And also, because a significant proportion of the drug molecules are rather absorbed at the surface of the nanoparticles than really encapsulated into the core, uh, you will have a burst. And to overcome this problem, more recently, we moved from the physical to the chemical encapsulation paradigm. In other words, we did chemistry instead of physics. And to do that, we used squalene. Why? Because the squalene is a natural and totally biocompatible lipid that we have everybody in our body, especially at the level of the skin. And very importantly, uh, the uh, squalene is the precursor for the biosynthesis of the cholesterol in the mammalians and in the humans. And this natural lipid, as you can see here, adopts, in fact, a molecular for the conformation in water. And we have taken advantage of this compact molecular conformation of squalene, of the squalene, to link to the squalene several drugs. And uh, you can see that you can use, uh, as a linker, a bioclevable link. And if you are putting this bioconjugate drug squalene into water, by supramolecular chemistry, those uh, molecules will self-assemble as nanoparticles with a size of around 100 nanometers. And this, uh, 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 those nanoparticles will be characterized by a much higher drug loading than after a physical encapsulation process processes because the uh, 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 link between the drug and the squalene uh, avoids the absence of burst release because each molecule of squalene is able to transport one molecule of the drug or even two or three as we did. This means a higher drug loading. And if you are able to design a bioclevable linker which will be sensitive to an endogenous stimulus, then you will get the drug leakage, the drug release, specifically in the target cells and in the target tissues. Now, in the field of the cancer, the first example is with the gemcitabine. You can see here in red the uh, structure of the gemcitabine, which is a major anti-cancer compound that we have linked here in blue with this quality. Once again, after putting this molecule into water, we got nanoparticles. But if you are looking well to the uh, cryotransmission electron microscopy, you can see that there is a supramolecular organization, as you can see here, under the form of columns. And by structural analysis, by X-ray diffraction at small angle scattering, we observed that those columns were due, in fact, 
to an inverted hexagonal phase resulting from the stacking of those bioconjugates. And this was confirmed by molecular model. Now, from a pharmacological point of view, we tested those nanoparticles in different preclinical models. Just uh, one example here with the P388 leukemia. You can see that uh, here you have the tumor nodule for the control untreated animals. After treatment with gemcitabine as a free drug, you can see that the tumor is resistant to gemcitabine. There is no a decrease of the tumor nodule. And after treatment with the gemcitabine squalene nanoparticles, you can see that the tumor had completely disappeared. And I would like to show you that this technology is highly flexible and versatile because we have linked the squalene with another major anti-cancer compound, once again, the doxorubicin. And after putting this bioconjugate into water, we got nanoparticles, but which were, as you can see here, elongated. This was really amazing. And we attribute this elongated formation of the uh, nanoparticles to the stacking properties of the doxorubicin uh, uh, moiety. And what is very interesting is that after uh, intravenous administration, you can see that whereas those nanoparticles were non-pegylated and non-functionalized, they were here in green, long circulating, comparatively to what happened in uh, uh, red after the administration of doxorubicin as a free drug. And this was explained by the fact that after intravenous administration, the doxorubicin squalene nanoparticles elongates through the glute flow streamlines and are not recognized as spherical particles by the macrophages of the reticular endothelial system, explaining the long circulating properties. And the result was also a complete modification of the uh, drug biodistribution. After administration as squalene doxorubicin nanoparticles, you can see that there was a dramatic decrease of the concentration of doxorubicin into the cardiac tissue, comparatively to what happens after the administration of doxorubicin as a free drug. And on the contrary, there was an increased concentration into the tumor nodule, comparatively to what happens after administration of the doxorubicin free. And this resulted in an increased anti-cancer uh, uh, activity of those nanoparticles in two experimental models, one human pancreatic myopathy and a murine uh, lung cancer. You can see clearly here in black the uh, evolution of the tumor volume for the untreated animals. If you are treating the animals with doxorubicin as a free drug, you can see that this tumor is clearly once again resistant to doxorubicin. And in green, after administration of the doxorubicin squalene nanoparticles, you can see that there was a very, very important inhibition of the tumor drug. And this was translated and confirmed also after taking some biopsies of those animals treated with the squalene doxorubicin nanoparticles, you can see here in the second line, an increase, a huge increase in the apoptosis and expression of the caspase 3 uh, uh, activity of the uh, uh, tumor cells, whereas it was not the case here after administration of doxorubicin uh, as a free drug. And on the contrary, the KE67, which is in, uh, uh, really a marker of the tumor proliferation, had completely disappeared in those biopsies of the animals treated with the nanoparticles, which once again uh, was not the case after administration with doxorubicin as a free drug. Then we tested the uh, digestive and the cardiac toxicity on the rat hypertensive model. What we did was to inject once a week during 11 weeks, first doxorubicin at the dose 
of one milligram per kilo body weight. And you can see that over the course of the disease, there was a huge increase in the uh, serum troponin, which is uh, an important marker of the cardiac toxicity. And at the end of the experiment, for those rats who survived, as you can see here, only 40 from the cardiac toxicity, if you are taking some biopsies, you can see a very, very strong vacuolization of the cardiomyocytes, which is the expression, once again, of a, a dramatic uh, cardiac toxicity. Now, if you are taking the doxorubicin squalene nanoparticles at the same dose, but also at the double and the triple of the dose, you can see that the troponin is remaining quite normal, just the same as the untreated rat or rats treated with a, a placebo. And you can see that 100% of the animals survived and that, that all the biopsies of those animals, the cardiac biopsies, were quite normal. So with a decreased toxicity and an increased activity, just by delivering in good way doxorubicin, we improved the therapeutic index. Just to convince you that it is really a, a, a generic uh, uh, technology, the, the so-called squalenoylation, we have linked a third major anti-cancer compound with squalene, which is a cisplatin, leading in this case to spherical nanoparticles. And you can see that after incubation with cancer cells, ELA cells, or the HT29 uh, colon cancer cells, there was a huge intracellular penetration here in red of the uh, cisplatin with a very important platination of the DNA, which was not the case when cisplatin was incubated as a free drug. And you can see that there was an increased anti-cancer activity in the cancer uh, transgenic mouse model after this time oral administration of the cisplatin squalene nanoparticles with a decrease in the number of intestinal uh, tumors. But what was still impressive is clearly the lower renal toxicity. Look here, the uh, structure of the uh, renal glomerulus for the healthy rats. After administration of the cisplatin, you can see that the histology of the kidneys was completely destroyed. The glomerulus, the glomerulus were completely destroyed. And after administration of the same dose of squalene cisplatin nanoparticles, you can see that the uh, renal structure, histological structure, was perfectly uh, preserved. Now, you will ask me the question, but how those nanoparticles which are not functionalized and uh, uh, which are not pegylated are able to target tumor or uh, cancer cells? Well, to investigate that and to answer this question, we investigated the interaction of those squalene gemcitabine, squalene doxorubicin, squalene cisplatin nanoparticles with the human blood in vitro and in vivo after intravenous administration to rats. And we were really surprised to observe that after administration, the nanoparticles disaggregated very rapidly, allowing the release, as you can see here, of the squalene gemcitabine bioconjugates and because of the squalene moiety here in blue, which is a precursor of the cholesterol biosynthesis, those individual molecules will insert into the cholesterol-rich lipoproteins, which are the LDL in humans, and as you can see here, the HDL in rodents. And in fact, uh, this allowed to have a very a clever uh, a drug targeting toward the cancer cells. Why? Because you know that most of the cancer cells are hyper-expressing here in green the LDL receptor. Because the cancer cells need to feed uh, with, uh, with lipids to make membrane, to multiplicate, etc., etc. 
And so finally, the nanoparticles, these quaternion-related nanoparticles, are using the LDL as indirect carriers for tumor targeting. And this is also a new way to see the drug delivery and the tumor uh, target. Now, I would like to continue in the field of the cancer with the possibility to design stimuli responsive uh, nano device. This means nanoparticles able to answer, uh, to react to an endogenous stimulus like a modification of the pH, uh, of, the redox, uh, of the redox status, of the enzymatic activity, for instance, into the tumor, or an, an exogenous stimulus uh, like a magnetic field light, ultrasound, temperature, etc., etc. And to show you that, I would like to show you what we did by using uh, uh, metal oxide frameworks that uh, we prepared as nanoparticles. You know that metal oxide frameworks are uh, iron iron oxide clusters that you can see here very clearly, which are condensed which are complexed with diacids, with different diacids. And depending on the uh, molecular weight of the diacids, on the flexibility of the diacids, you can uh, control the size of the pores of the nanomorph. And you can design those pores so that they have the same uh, size than the hosted molecule. And I would like just to show you one example with Bussin. In fact, busulfan is a major anti-cancer compound, which is used in uh, pediatric uh, cancers at very high doses. And unfortunately, busulfan is inducing a veno-occlusive disease of the liver, and sometimes with a high toxicity and even the death of the, of the kids, unfortunately. And so since a long time, we have tried to encapsulate busulfan in pegylated liposomes nanoparticles to avoid the capture by the liver. And it was not possible because busulfan is crystallizing very, very rapidly. And in fact, we succeeded to encapsulate busulfan into those nanomorphs because each molecule of busulfan in this formulation is separated from its neighboring molecule and there is no crystallization process. And so we could load those nanomorphs with around 20% of busulfan, which was never done previously. And what is very interesting with this technology is that iron oxide, as you know, is decreasing the T2 signal at magnetic resonance in aging. So you can do MRI. You can follow the nanoparticles after intravenous administration and look, for instance, to the collapse or to the growth of the tumor, depending on the treatment. And this was the first time we proposed this concept of nanoteranostic. This means nanoparticles uh, aggregating in the same nanoparticle a therapeutic functionality due to, to the encapsulation of several drugs with a diagnostic uh, functionality due to the possibility to do some MRI uh, imaging. And more recently, we observed that those nanomorphs were pH sensitive. Indeed, those nanoparticles, as you can see here, are quite stable with a size of 100 nanometers at an acidic pH. They are prepared at an acidic pH. But after incubation with serum, as you can see here in this uh, uh, cartoon, there was a huge augmentation of the size of the nanomorph due to some micro aggregation. And in fact, you observed that those micro aggregates disappeared very rapidly. And so we injected those nanoparticles intravenously and we looked to the biodistribution of the iron, uh, you can see that in blue, and those nanoparticles concentrated because of this aggregation into the lungs with a small inflammatory process, which disappeared very rapidly, as you can see here, uh, after uh, four and six hours. And so it was a way to conduct a drug 
into the lung tissue as we did with gemcitabine uh, uh, monophosphate loaded into those uh, uh, nanomorphs. You can see in blue that we increase dramatically the concentration of the drug at the level of the pulmonary uh, uh, tissue, which was not the case after administration of the uh, gemcitabine as a free drug. And on the Lewis lung carcinoma, uh, with a lot of uh, inducing uh, uh, lung metastasis, you can see that only the nanomorph loaded with the uh, uh, gemcitabine monophosphate were able to decrease the number of metastases, which was not the case after administration of the free drug. Now, for the second part of my lecture, I would like to uh, uh, look to some possible application in uh, neuroscience without the need for the nanoparticles to pass through the blue brain barrier. You know that uh, worldwide, and including we, a lot of uh, uh, groups of uh, laboratories are trying to design nanoparticles able to pass the blood brain barrier, which uh, can induce some toxicological concerns for different reasons. And we have demonstrated that without passing uh, some uh, uh, the, the blood brain barrier, but by, but by acting on peripheral receptors, it is possible to have some application of the nanomedicine in the neuroscience field. And the first example is uh, the uh, use of uh, adenosine. Because adenosine, as you know, it is a neuromodulator which should have a very strong pharmacological efficacy in several neurological disorders. But unfortunately, this molecule is rapidly metabolized after intravenous injection with a half-life of only uh, 10 seconds. And this is the reason why we have linked this squalene with the amino group of adenosine, which is sensitive to the deamination after intravenous administration to protect the amino group from the uh, degradation. And we have used those uh, adenosine squalene nanoparticles for the treatment of the uh, spinal cord injury using the T9 uh, uh, weight drop injury, as you can see here. And this injury will induce a trauma which will paralyze the hand limb of the animals. You can see here in red that after administration of the adenosine as a free drug, there is no recovery of the locomotor score, but that after administration of the adenosine squalene nanoparticles, you can see that there was a recovery of the locomotor score just because uh, we have preserved, as you can see here in those biopsies, the small myelinated axons, which were less uh, damaged than after administration of uh, adenosine as a free drug. And I have here a small film, which is uh, showing you uh, uh, this. First with the uh, uh, so-called uh, sham uh, trauma group, in which you can see that uh, uh, in this model, the uh, rats have the uh, hind limbs completely paralyzed. They are unable, in fact, to work uh, uh, with the hind limbs. After treatment with the adenosine solution, because of the fast metabolization of adenosine, there is no pharmacological activity. The same with the only squalene nanoparticles without the linkage with adenosine. Per se, the squalene has no uh, pharmacological activity. And after injection of the adenosine squalene nanoparticles, four years after the treatment, four days, excuse me, after the treatment, you can see that the rats were able to move uh, uh, freely on the ground uh, without any uh, problem. And then uh, we use the same technology uh, to look uh, the activity on the uh, brain uh, ischemia. To do that, uh, we used a filament that we inserted into the right carotid uh, uh, artery. And this induced, as you can see here, an important ischemic zone. And after treatment with adenosine as a free drug, you can see that there was no decrease of the infarct volume comparatively to the vehicle, as you can see here. 
but after administration of the adenosine squalene nanoassemblies, either pre ischemia at two doses or post ischemia, or after 24 hours permanent occlusion, you can see that a strong neuroprotection occurs with an important diminution of the infarct volume. And in fact, we investigated the mechanism behind this uh, uh, neurological activity by uh, investigating the biodistribution of those nanoparticles and of the uh, adenosine squalene. And we observed that there was a total absence of translocation of those nanoparticles through the blood brain barrier, but that on the contrary, those nanoparticles once again were long circulating, were stealth. And they represented a sort of reservoir of adenosine into the blood compartments, allowing the release of intact adenosine at the level of the adenosine A to B receptors, which are located at the level of the brain uh, uh, microcirculation. And this will induce a vessel relaxation, a decrease in the number, as you can see here of the ischemic capillaries with a better reperfusion, as you can see here, and therefore a neuroprotection. And uh, this explains once again that it is possible to induce a neuroprotection only playing on perif peripheral uh, receptors. And we followed the same way of reasoning still more recently uh, to uh, uh, try to treat uh, a pain by using the same uh, technology and by playing on peripheral receptors. Why? Because you know that uh, morphine, the misuse of morphine, morphine derivatives, and more generally in opioid derivatives, has represented a national crisis in USA, also uh, in Europe, even to probably a little bit lower extent. In USA, you have 11 million of patients, indeed, who are addicted to the treatments with opioid derivatives, representing around in between 100 and 200 deaths per day uh, on the mean. And this is due to the fact that morphine and morphine derivatives are inducing addiction tolerance first, addiction then, and even pulmonary decline. You know that the endogenous neuropeptides, which are liberated from the neurons, like encephaline, like endorphin, may represent an attractive option, which has been uh, uh, tested, but unfortunately not efficiently because once again, the encephaline are rapidly metabolized with a half-life of only a few minutes. And this is a reason why we have synthesized a small library of uh, uh, leuencephaline squalene uh, uh, bioconjugates by using a deoxycarbonyl, a diglycolic, and or an amide linker, leading, as you can see here, to nanoparticles with a size in between 70 and 120 nanometers. And we have tested the pharmacological activity of those nanoparticles on the inflammatory pain. And to do that, we have injected carrageenan uh, into the right paw of rats. You can see the swelling of the paw with an inflammatory pain. And by using the hard grief test, we have tested the analgesic activity by measuring the paw withdrawal latency after, as you can see here, illumination of the uh, right paw of the uh, rats. And here are the results. Look what happened with morphine. In fact, you can see that the power withdrawal latency is about seven seconds for the uh, uh, normal power. When you have treated the power with carrageenan, uh, because of the pain sensation, you have a decrease in the power withdrawal latency. After treatment with morphine in blue, you will increase dramatically the, 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 the Paw withdrawal latency until 12 to 14 seconds, which is too high uh, as compared to a normal paw, but the activity is decreasing very rapidly. Now, 
if before the treatment of morphine, we are treating the animals with naloxone, which is an antagonist of morphine at the level of the mu receptors of the brain, you can see that you abolished all the antinociceptive activity of morphine. More interestingly, if you are using naloxone methiodine, which is also the same antagonist, but not passing through the blood brain barrier, you can see that you don't abolish the analgesic effect of morphine. And this is a clear demonstration that morphine uh, is acting through a central analgesic effect, which was, of course, already known, leading to uh, uh, addiction and tolerance. Now, what happened with the nanoparticles? You can see that after injection of the squalene leoncephaline nanoparticles with a diglycolic linker, we have a long lasting uh, analgesic effect with a much higher area under the curve than the morphine. And the level of the uh, antinociception is the same than for a normal pose. So you have no hyperalgesia. After injection of the peptide as a free compound, you can see that there is no activity. And interestingly, after injection of naloxone methiodite before the treatment, you can see that you completely abolished the uh, uh, analgesic effect of the long tephaline squalene nanoparticles, contrary to what was observed with morphine. And this is a demonstration that those nanoparticles uh, are acting in terms of pain alleviation through a peripheral pharmacological activity. And the same was observed with the uh, 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 nanoparticles uh, with an amide linker or a deoxycarbonyl linker between the uh, neuropeptide and the squalene. Now, how to explain that? To do that, we, we have labeled those uh, leoncephaline squalene nanoparticles, as you can see here, with a fluorescent dye. And you can see uh, that after an intravenous administration by imaging, we observe that over the time, those nanoparticles concentrated into the right inflamed and painful pole, as you can see here in this magnification. And this is due in fact to the leaky vasculature that you have at the level of the inflammatory process, allowing the nanoparticles to extravasate uh, at the level of the uh, uh, location of the pain. Now, if you are looking to what happens at the level of the brain by imaging or uh, after uh, the end of the experiment by taking the different tissues, you can see that those nanoparticles were not traversing, translocating through the blood brain barrier. They have no access to the brain. And this is the explanation why those nanoparticles have an antinociceptive effect because they are acting on peripheral receptors, but not on brain receptors. And these allow to have an analgesic effect, but uh, with suppression of the addiction side. Now, I would like to move to the uh, possibility to use multidrug nanoparticles to target inflammatory tissues. And this is very interesting approach because as you know, some patients, of course, a small num number, which are uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, are evolving uh, towards a severe uh, disease with an uncontrolled paradoxal inflammatory process of the pulmonary tissue. And in fact, uh, uh, this results from a vicious cycle between inflammation and oxidative stress. You can see that the lymphocytes, the neutrophil, uh, will be activated, will induce a transmigration into the uh, tissue. Uh, they will induce the liberation of chymokine, of reactive oxygen species, inducing uh, an oxidative stress with tissue injury. And this will trigger once again the inflammatory process uh, to become worse. So it is really a, a vicious uh, cycle. And to stop this vicious cycle, we have decided to design uh, uh, dual modal 
uh, nanoparticles by combining from one side adenosine squalene, which act also on adenosine E3 receptors, uh, which are uh, anti-inflammatory receptors, with tocopherol, which is a, a, a vitamin E with an antioxidative effect to design those multi-drug nanoparticles, which are, as you can see here, uh, uh, spherical and with a size of around 60 uh, uh, nanometers. And you can see that uh, when you have uh, uh, animals with an endotoxemia uh, uh, model following a lipopolysaccharide challenge with a, a, a septic shock, with a paradoxal inflammation, uh, you can see that after intravenous administration, those multidrug nanoparticles will concentrate in the inflammatory tissues, especially the liver, the lungs, and also, as you can see here, the kidneys. And the result of that is that in blue, after treatment with the multidrug nanoparticles, you will reduce the pro-inflammatory cytokines, including MCP1, EL6, in the lungs here, in the kidneys here, and in the liver, comparatively to all the other controls, uh, including, of course, the uh, adenosine vitamin E cocktail of the free drugs. And also at the level of the plasma, you can see that there was a significant decrease of the TNF-alpha, which is also a pro-inflammatory cytokine. And very interestingly, if you are looking to EL10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine, you can see that after treatment with the multidrug nanoparticles, you have in fact increased the anti-inflammatory cytokine. And the result of that is that after treatment with the uh, multidrug uh, uh, nanoparticles, you have much better in blue uh, clinical scores than the animals treated with a cocktail of the free drugs or in black, the uh, untreated animals. And this was translated in uh, survival. You have indeed, as you can see here, 100% uh, survival of the animals after the uh, treatment with the multidrug nanoparticles, only 60% after treatment with the free drugs, and only 40% uh, for the untreated animals. And interestingly, if you are looking to the lipid peroxidation in the lungs, it was decreased after treatment with the adenosine squalene vitamin E nanoparticles. Now I will close with my uh, two last uh, uh, slides concerning the possibility also to target the infected endolysosomal compartment and to treat resistant infectious disease. You know that normally when you have uh, uh, an infection and if you are in a good shape, your macrophages and dendritic cells, etc., etc., will take up the bacteria. And when the bacteria are located into the cell uh, uh, lysosomes, they will be degraded by the uh, lysosomal enzymes. But unfortunately, in case of immunodepression, instead of being degraded, those bacteria will multiplicate, kill the macrophages, infected other macrophages, and reduce still uh, uh, a lower, a lower uh, immunologic uh, uh, reaction. Now, of course, you will tell me, OK, but we can treat uh, uh, those uh, intracellular infectious disease with antibiotics. Well. No, it is very difficult because, first of all, penicillin, which is a weak acid, is unable to enter into the cells because ionized at the extracellular uh, neutral uh, pH. And if you are taking a basic antibiotic like uh, gen gentamicin, this uh, antibiotic is inactive at the acidic pH of the phagolysis. And this is the reason why we have considered the possibility to use pH-sensitive nanoparticles, which will be taken up by the macrophages by 
uh, phagocytosis or endocytosis, ending into those endo uh, lysosomes where are located the bacteria at an acidic pH and uh, releasing the antibiotic only at the acidic pH. And to do that, we have used once again the squalene that we have linked to a pH sensitive link with uh, penicillin to allow the intracellular delivery of those nanoparticles. And as you can see, at least uh, in vitro, it is working very well because if you are taking Staphylococcus uh, aureus, resistant Staphylococcus aureus, that you are incubating with macrophages, you can see very clearly that this macrophage is done, not doing the job to kill the intracellular bacteria because you can see in green the uh, surviving bacteria and in red the dead bacteria. Now, if you are treating those cells with penicillin as a free drug, you will kill all the extracellular uh, bacteria, but not the intracellular bacteria because penicillin is not penetrating intracellular. And now if you are doing the same with those uh, penicillin squalene nanoparticles, able to release the antibiotic at the acidic pH of the uh, lysosome, you are able to kill all the intracellular bacteria. And now I come to my uh, conclusion, and uh, I hope that I have convinced you that uh, uh, nanomedicine uh, is able through those illustrations, through those examples, to target the diseased uh, area, either because you have a ligand, for instance, biotin, it is just an illustration, or because you are using endogenous LDL or HDL to allow the indirect transport of the drug towards the cancer cells. As you have seen with the uh, polyalkyl cyanoacrylate nanoparticles loaded with the doxorubicin for the uh, hepatocarcinoma, you can overcome the resistance to the treatments uh, in the field of the cancer because overcoming the uh, P-glycoprotein, but also in the field of the resistant intracellular uh, infectious disease, as it was shown uh, uh, just with uh, uh, Staphylococcus uh, aureus. Also, uh, those nanoparticles, nanomedicine in general, can penetrate efficiently intracellularly. As I have shown you with those nanomorph, it is, com it is possible to combine various functionalities into the same nanotechnology, including uh, a therapy, for instance, and imaging for nanotheranostic, but also uh, uh, multi-drug nanoparticles with two drugs which will act on two different biological uh, uh, targets. And also, you can be uh, uh, stimuli responsive, uh, as I have showed you uh, with those uh, pH-sensitive nanomorphs or pH-sensitive uh, nanoparticles. And I would like to acknowledge all the people of my group uh, who have collaborated more or less uh, to one or another example or illustration I have shown to you. Uh, thank you also to the European Research Council, uh, which have given me more than uh, 2 million euros uh, to develop the uh, squalene annihilation technology. And thank you very much. Thank you so much for your uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. This is a wonderful presentation. Uh, a little bit of remembering the old days and how you started. And then many of the new studies and the new data that we all appreciate. I will ask one question and then I will pass it to Alice, who will direct the whole panel discussion. My question is, I've known the story of the squalene for a very, very long time. But in the early days when I was looking at that structure, because of the rings and so on, I was always concerned that this was going to be a highly toxic material, toxic in another sense, that it wouldn't be able to be used in cancer. How did you have this idea to go with squalene rather than something else? 
because I think you started that, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a very interesting question. This is a typical example of chance, you know, and serendipity. And I am convinced that in the reserves, serendipity is very important. In fact, the story was as follows. I had a PhD student from Italy, Barbara Stella, uh, from Turin University, and uh, she was uh, developing those nanoparticles which were functionalized uh, with uh, folic acid and biotin, encapsulating a fluorescent dye and showing that we targeted uh, uh, cancer cells. And then uh, we decided to encapsulate an anti-cancer compound. And uh, uh, I proposed to encapsulate doxorubicin because we did it already with a polyalkyl cyanoacrylate. And Barbara told me, no, why not gemcitabine? I said, OK, why not? We will try another drug. So sometimes we need to follow the IDs of the PhD students. You know? <laughs> and, <laughs> and we did it. And uh, it was difficult because gemcitabine is, is a hydrophilic molecule. And it was absolutely impossible to encapsulate uh, uh, the uh, gemcitabine into those polyalkyl cyanoacrylate nanoparticles. And Very so we looked, we looked to the patent of, uh, of uh, uh, Eli Lilly, who developed gemcitabine, and they did some lipophilic conjugates with fatty acids. And we used those conjugates to encapsulate, but it was not possible because they were not soluble in water in, in, the, in the process of the uh, preparation of the polyalkyl cyanoacrylate nanoparticles, we need a water medium to make the polymerization process. So we decided to use uh, condensed lipids and we talked about cholesterol first, but to inject cholesterol intravenously is bad. So we looked to squalene because it is a precursor of the biosynthesis of the cholesterol. And we observed amazingly and by chance that the squalene induced the formation of nanoparticles just spontaneously by supramolecular chemistry without doing nothing. Okay. okay. Very good. Yeah, that's a very good story. So I would like to thank you. I'd like to pass the floor to Alice, who okay, will Okay, great. I'm here. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Nicholas. Yeah, that's very nice and very nice questions. And uh, really proud of that. So uh, we're going to introduce our panelist, uh, uh, Professor Gu Jin. Uh, he's, uh, now working, uh, he's now working in Zhejiang University uh, as a dean. Yeah, so he was a graduate from Nanjing University for bachelor and master's degree and then got a PhD from UCLA. Uh, he was uh, uh, started with, I think it's a postdoc with uh, 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 Professor Barbara Langer and the MIT, and then how going to be independent uh, first and the job here. And then he's a uh, uh, full professor at UCLA. Now he's back to Zhejiang University and uh, be a uh, dean. Uh, he's now the youngest one, right? <laughs> the dean. Yeah, so we're very proud of that. And uh, we also have a, a, a Panelist was uh, Yi Kun Li uh, from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, actually, uh, Yi Kun was also the alumni from UCLA. He got his PhD there and then he moved to Hong Kong. Uh, he was working in Hong Kong University of Science and Technology for, I think, almost 20 years, right, Yi Kun? So, almost yeah, yeah. the first uh, you know, group was working there. And uh, he from the microfluid and then developed a lot of uh, kind of instruments and the method to, you know, for the uh, cancers detection uh, now is working more for the COVID-19. Yeah, that's a very good achievement. And uh, we have Tian Yuan Zhang. Uh, Dr. Tian Yuan Zhang was from Zhejiang University too. And uh, he's uh, our youngest scientist and uh, he's very active. And they uh, did uh, a very nice talk, you know, in ICANX Breakers. And then now this time we invited him to be an uh, ex challenger here. As a challenger meanings, uh, yeah, have to ask some challenger questions. Yeah. So uh, now go to our panel uh, discussions. And the first, uh, of course, it's time for Qian Yuan. Yeah. Dr. Zhang, are you ready to challenge you? <laughs> I'm ready. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, professors. 
And thank you for Professor Patrick. I think this is a really uh, impressive talk and especially give me some new thinking for the young scientists. So um, for today, I have two questions that uh, the first one is I'm very impressive, impressive for the uh, smart design that you imply the LDL as indirect carrier for the targeting delivery to tumors. But my question is that we know the receptors of LDL not only express in the tumors, but also widely present in the uh, maybe the blood vessels and the liver. So how do you solve these problems? Because we know that uh, the LDL not only guiding them to the tumor tissues, but maybe also guiding to the liver. So maybe also lead to the uh, accumulation in the liver to keep some side effects. So how do you to, do you solve these problems? That's my first question. Questions. Yeah, this is uh, of course a very, a very an excellent question because uh, you know the LDL are not going uh, really into the liver, but indeed at the level of the vessels. You are right, and uh, you know uh, it's clear that we are not performing a perfect targeting. But when you have a, a, a solid tumor. Uh, which is uh, important, you know, the solid tumor, because uh, the cells are multiplicating, they have a much higher expression of the LDL receptors than uh, the LDL receptors at the level of the blood vessels. And the typical example is that in the clinic, you know, people uh, uh, with uh, an advanced cancer, I am speaking about advanced cancer, they have all hypo cholesterolemia, uh, okay. because in fact, the cancer cells are engulfing uh, the LDL so much that you have a decrease of the cholesterol at the level of the, of the blood flow, of the blood stream, of the, of the blood in general. And, but you are right, it's not, uh, nobody's perfect. It's not the perfect targeting. We are going also to the uh, blood vessels, of course. But now in the clinic, it will be a matter, of course, of doses of uh, uh, stage of the tumor, because probably you have not to treat at the starting of the tumor when the number of cells is limited. Uh, so we have to design, of course, the better uh, schedule of administration. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. And um, my second question is that, uh, uh, we know people have talked about the nanomedicines for decades, maybe before I was born, people talk about the nanomedicines. But uh, still now I'm got, after I got my PhD, uh, the nanomedicines, the real application of nanomedicines in the clinic is still not so widely. And as you talk about, you have doing some uh, phase two and phase three uh, clinical trials, and you found that maybe the therapeutic efficiency was not as good as demonstrated in the animals. So uh, in your opinions, what is the major challenges for the real applications of nanomedicines in the clinic? That's my second question, thank you. Okay, you know, uh, just to give you uh, the, the problem we had with the doxorubicin uh, uh, polyalkyl cyanide nanoparticles, uh, Clearly, uh, we did, uh, I think that the, 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 the nanoparticles loaded to, uh, with doxorubicin were very efficient into the clinic. But we did, and probably the CAO of the company did a big mistake. Because at the second phase clinical trials, uh, we had really impressive results with a much higher survival curve than the uh, consensus treatment. And okay. then we started with a third phase. And in fact, we had the possibility to have an agreement with big pharmaceutical companies. But the CIO and the member of the uh, uh, administration council uh, considered that the startup company was able to let the uh, phase three uh, clinical trial alone. And this was a mistake because we were only a small uh, a company and even if we enter the stock market, we had a limited amount of, uh, of money. And okay. what happened is that the recruitment of the patients took in fact uh, uh, five years. And during those five years, the consensus treatment has changed to a multi-therapy. And then we were equal 
in terms of uh, survival and anti-cancer efficacy. But because a lack of money, we didn't uh, test sufficiently the comparison from the point of view of the toxicity. And we should have patient by patient to compare the multidrug therapy and the uh, transdrug therapy. And we didn't uh, do that because of a matter of money. And I am sure that if we have collaborated with the big pharma, we should have a better results because probably we should come before uh, the consensus treatment was the multi-drug uh, therapy. And we would have also uh, still the uh, uh, chemobolization as a consensus treatment. So you can see it's not a matter in that case of science, but it is a matter, I would say, of uh, busyness <laughs> and, way to conduct a, and way to conduct a company. Now, to, to, to answer more generally to, to your question, uh, you have around, it depends how you are counting, but you have around uh, 40 uh, to 50, depends. Mitagotri did a very nice paper on that. Uh, uh, drugs, nanomedicine on the market. It's not bad. It's not bad. And uh, I would say now that with the uh, vaccination against the COVID, if you don't have the, the, the lipid nanoparticles, you have no vaccine. No nanoparticles, no vaccine. This is what I am claiming here in France uh, uh, with the Minister of uh, Health, uh, because nobody, uh, the people don't realize that uh, the way to give is as important as what is given. Now, to finish my answer to your question, of course, we can still improve, probably by doing more personalized medicine. And everybody agree with that, because now when you have a, 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 a targeted, uh, like with monoclonal antibodies or with uh, other type of uh, targeted uh, uh, treatments, uh, the clinical trials are done only on a limited number of uh, patients which are well chosen. And this allowed to have a higher percentage of response than if you are taking a lot of patients with uh, breast cancer, for instance, but without uh, 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 measuring the biomarkers which allow to do a precision medicine. And I think we have to do that uh, for the, with the uh, nanomedicine too, more to identify what is a class uh, of the patients uh, who will not suffer. Uh, we will, for instance, answer to the uh, PR effect and will not suffer from uh, uh, toxicity. Okay, that's very nice. Yeah, I think this was a, a very good question, so not only for the scientists, but also for the business. Yeah, so uh, Gu Zhen, yeah, I think you have something to say, right? <laughs> Zhen, you mute, yeah. Hi, Zhen, you mute. Yes, uh, just a quick question uh, to Patrick, actually uh, ask from my students. They said it's like uh, now today is like a drug delivery, um, it's relatively crowded field. Then, you know, it's really challenging to distinguish one individual's work from the most people's work. Could you please give any suggestion like uh, how to generate uh, relatively unique work, you know, in the field, especially in the drug delivery field regarding the nanomedicine? Thank you. Thank you for this question. Then uh, my I think that uh, there are two things which are very uh, important. The first one, again, is to take the opportunity uh, that you have not foreseen before. Uh, once again, uh, the serendipity is very important. If I am looking, I did this, uh, this uh, uh, look. I look to all the grants I proposed. And then I look to the results. What were the more interesting results? Never what was uh, previously anticipated. And I think it is very important to catch some results which are amazing, unattempted, not willing eventually, and to think out of the box. And this was typically, uh, uh, just to illustrate that, uh, typically what we did uh, with the neurological uh, disorders. Uh, because during, I would say, 
probably a decade, like a lot of uh, groups, we try to develop polyalkyl cyanoacrylate nanoparticles with ligands like transferrin, et cetera, et cetera, to uh, translocate the blood brain barrier and to have nanoparticles into the brain. But at one day, uh, with my PhD students, uh, we did a sort of uh, 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 seminar. And we said, OK, we have two problems with this approach. First of all, if you have nanoparticles of polyalkyl cyanoacrylate, of PLGA, with other polymers into the brain, from a toxicological point of view, how will be the metabolization process into the brain tissue? We don't know, because as you know, in the brain uh, tissue, you have a very, very low uh, uh, metabolization process. The excretion from the brain occurs, of course, but at the very low level, uh, at the lower level than uh, uh, into the liver or the <coughs> kidney, et cetera, et cetera. So we have, uh, first of all, a toxicological problem to induce nanoparticles to enter into the brain because it is a job of the blood brain barrier to uh, hinder uh, particles to enter into the brain. That's one thing. The second thing was, OK, we have central receptors to treat the neurological disorders. But we have also uh, uh, peripheral receptors. And so uh, we took, OK, we will probably use the peripheral receptors to solve not all problems, of course, but some problems uh, with this example with pain and this example with uh, adenosine swollen. And it is a way to think out of the box. And in all my career, I always lit listen a lot to uh, uh, the PhD students because they are coming sometimes with crazy ideas. And sometimes they can be crazy. But sometimes, well, there is something interesting. We, we can try to, 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 to see uh, if there is a proof of concept of that. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Probably, uh, Nicholas, could you please also comment on this? I feel you may also have some idea. Well, I give the, the right, if you wish, to students to interfere and come up with new ideas. Your question is a very difficult one. Here's a young student seeing this whole sea of papers and says, what am I going to do that is different and that will succeed? Because the last thing students and young assistant professors want is to work on something and then discover it doesn't work. I have a colleague that most of you know, Professor George Giorgio, who is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and the National Academy of Engineering, who says all of these particles have saved millions of mice, but have they saved many humans? Um, I think it is important for the students to get the message. Continue working on what you believe. Let it be on uh, on uh, important, uh, 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 you know, uh, on important background and so on. Use your molecular biology, your biochemistry, and so on. Do good work. If it doesn't work, still it will help the rest of us understand a particular problem. So it's not lost time. It's nothing is lost time in cancer. It helps others say, ah, okay, this approach will not work. We will work with another. So don't despair, be positive. Go to meetings, present your data, write the papers, write them in good journals, not in second rate journals, not in what we call in the United States, fly by night journals. Journals that tell you at three o'clock in the morning, please publish. Don't do that. Go to the major journals and you will be rewarded. And you and your students and your colleagues uh, will be happy. You see a man who has spent maybe 45 years on the subject. He didn't give up. And he's a professor emeritus. Many professor emeriti now, they are sitting back watching television and drinking good wine in France or beer in the United States. <laughs> But instead, he continues working because he cares. Because all of us around this table and all the people who spoke in the ICANN's seminars, they care about people. Yeah. They don't do it for the money. 
or for the patents or for the awards. They do it because they want to see humans be saved. So I, I hope, Jan, that this is a positive comment for your students. And uh, as long as you have a good background, continue working on it, even if it doesn't succeed. In our mind, it has succeeded. Thanks. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Yeah. Very nice. Very, very nice. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, Yiquan, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's my turn. Uh, first, thank uh, Patrick for your uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I, I do think, uh, I do agree with you about serendipity. So, so sometimes uh, when you do research, you know, you suddenly you come with total different unexpected results. So my, my question for you is, uh, I know you are working on some kind of stimuli with bumped nano, uh, this kind of device medicine. So is it possible uh, you can think about in the future so that you may think about those kind of a smart nano medicine. Smart, that means smart is not only the one what you, you show here. Maybe in the future we are additional AI <laughs> to be really intelligent to come with no, smart nano medicine or AI based nano medicine. Yeah, yeah, you are right. We have to go in this uh, uh -huh. direction. <laughs> and uh, I think that for the uh, stimuli responsive, in so-called intelligent, yeah, intelligent. Uh, stimuli responsive uh, <laughs> uh, uh, nanoparticles or nanomedicine, there are two important ways to follow. One is the chemistry. The mm. chemistry, in my opinion, is, is, is very important because if you are able to uh, uh, combine uh, uh, a very intelligent uh, a sensitive nanoparticles who will release the drug, uh, for instance, because you have a specific enzymes into a tumor or into an infected cell or uh, a, a, patholo a pathological medium, which is specific, then you can have a so-called intelligent nanoparticles or nano device. But you have also the, uh, the physics, you know, uh, because uh, as you know, there are a lot of wonderful uh, uh, works, uh, studies, which are published uh, by using laser light, by using uh, 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 magnetic fields, by using uh, uh, nano bubbles, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, uh, to target also the release of a drug in the good at the good moment and in the good uh, area uh, of the body. So I think that the basic science are remaining very, very important. And uh, for the people like me uh, who are in the nanomedicine field, but uh, I am not really an expert in chemistry, neither an expert, less an expert still in, in, in physics. We need to have interdisciplinary groups with people able to do fundamental science. And it is possibly from fundamental science that we will find new way to have intelligent nanomedicine. This is my, my feeling. Thank you so much for your-, your Okay, uh, so okay, here uh, is one question from the audience. It's a uh, following, you know, equance question. Uh, has uh, consumption uh, from many, uh, consumption possibly on the multi, uh, multi-tasking uh, tasking, uh, nanomedicine, you know? Multitasking, you know, yeah. uh, you mean nanomedicine, which have a drug, for instance, for instance, insight, and also which responds to a physical being? Is it, is it the question? Uh, not that clear. I think it's like this, yeah. Yes, uh, well, you have a, if you are looking to the literature, once again, the good uh, journals, of course, uh, you have a lot of, uh, uh, excellent papers showing that you can combine both uh, the pharmacological activity of a drug and also a physical activity, like for instance, heating a tumor. And if you are combining heating a tumor and also uh, uh, playing with uh, the release at the good moment, and at the good side of the body, uh, which is active, you will increase, of course, the uh, uh, therapeutic index of the drug. 
Okay, cool. Uh, actually, uh, today we have a little bit more time. I I want to ask one question, the last question. Okay, yeah. As for, I see these pictures for you and the Nicholas. Yeah, more than 40 years, you know, friendship. And, uh, <laughs> okay, and working in the very similar field and also have a very happy life. Uh, my question is how you keep that. So for the science, you know, you are a collaborator or you are a competitor? <laughs> no, we are, <laughs> we are not at all competitors, not at all. We are very good friends since a long time. And this is still more important than, 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 uh, than, than the rest, you know. Okay, I say you are uh, and, challenging and, each other. <laughs> and I want, I want to say, Alice, that all of us continue working and interacting. Uh, there are discussions, private, of course, by email. There are other presentations and so on. I'm organizing a very big symposium in November in Washington, yeah. D.C., where Patrick is one of the invited speakers. And this is exactly what we call convergence in the United States. He said it a few minutes ago. You cannot solve the problem of cancer with just chemists, just biologists, mm -hmm. just the medical doctors. All of us have to come together and in a changing world. But you're right. And sometimes I sit down and I wonder, because as you probably know, people like Bob Langer and myself and Mike Seft and of course, Patrick Couvreur and a few others that you saw, we were all together from the beginning. Obviously, one influenced the other. There is no doubt. But the important thing is what I said a little while ago. I am 74 in August. I think Patrick is a little bit younger. <laughs> Not much younger, a little See, bit right. younger. We don't sit by, I mean, do we like vacation? Of course we like vacation. But there are important uh, problems in, in the world to be solved. There are important problems in China, in Japan, in Singapore, in the United States, in Europe, in France, in Germany. Who is going to solve them? The young ones, absolutely. We are all supportive of the young ones. There is no doubt about it. But as long as we read, we have the ability to contribute something. Uh, as you know, in the United States, there is no retirement age for professors. So in principle, and as long as my health is good, I can continue working. In Europe, there is a retirement age of, what is it, Patrick, 67? Uh, normally, no, 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 no. Normally, uh, in France, for a professor is sixty-five. Uh, sixty-five. Okay. If Same as you have, uh, if you are a full professor uh, at the last stage, you can ask for three years more. And if you have three children or more, you can still <laughs> have one year more. <laughs> so I so you are, I could, you are in good I could shape. Stop at seventy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, but the important thing is. And I know this happens also in China, the younger generation looks upon the senior people and says they can still contribute something. And we appreciate that. And we try our best to continue working in those areas and contribute. I know that Patrick is admired by his former students who are all professors now, by Julien Nicolas and Simona Mura and Elias Fatal, who I'm pretty sure are in the audience because I made sure they all got letters today, this morning. So it is, I mean, let's, let's stress the important thing. We are working because we want to help people. And that is really the most important thing. Okay. Thank you for Great. being such a good catalyst, Alice. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I really, really feel, you know, are great about these pictures. You know, I see that, mm -hmm. you know, that's many, many years ago because I saw, you know, on this stage, I could go Zhen Tian Yuan Yi Kun all are, you know, the youngest, right? <laughs> the okay. young generations. And now it's time, you know, working together. I think many, many people are working and fighting for the, you know, real problem. Help the people. Yeah, not only the people in some certain place, it's the people in the whole world, right? You try to help them solve the problems. That means, you know, contribute to the, you know, 
uh, the humankind, right? The universe. I think I like this, you know, I can add the, the slogan is connect world and universe. I think we, you know, working on the science and technology, we try to, you know, help all the people in the world and the universe. Yeah, we try to get everyone feelings, you know, much better you know, in this world. Yeah, so uh, that that's, yeah, really, really great. I'm uh, really appreciative for all of you. I hope, you know, we keep on continuing for this. Uh, I can ask the wonderful talks and uh, all these things. Yeah, thank you all, everyone, yeah. So, uh, Patrick, I feel proud of that. So, I, I deliver this virtual uh, electric, you know, certification to you for I can answer. I hope. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, to Nick. Thank you so much, Alice. Uh, it was a very nice uh, discussion. Uh, okay, cool. Thank yeah, you. we we really working together to connect world and universe. We make it better and uh, much better. Yeah, <laughs> in our hands. Try. Yeah. So, okay, yeah, next week we're going to have two young scientists, Deep, uh, Jerry Valla and uh, Haidin. They were going to talk about, uh, you know, something uh, interesting in the semiconductor. And, uh, uh, okay, next week we also have MIT A and B uh, to talk about applied energy. This was uh, be four days. So you uh, you can hear a lot of talks on the, you know, live show. So uh, welcome to join us. That's all for today. Okay, thank you very much.